So far we've seen the three central institutions of medieval Europe, the church, feudalism, and chivalry, um, stay pretty strong. But starting in the 1300s, we start to see a series of disasters that are going to weaken those institutions. So we're going to see what those disasters are and what effects they had on our medieval institutions. Uh, one of those major um, disasters was the Western Schism. Uh, sometimes you also see it called the Great Schism or the Papal Schism. Um, we're going to call it the Western Schism to distinguish it from the other religious conflict we saw between Constantinople and Rome. Uh, but the situation was this. In 1307, um, King Philip of France summoned the Pope to, uh, to France. Uh, Philip was upset about mostly some property issues he had with uh, some other religious orders in France. But ultimately what happened is the Pope died under uh, Philip's imprisonment. Um, and after the Pope died, of course, they needed to elect a new Pope. But Philip really sort of exerted his influence on the French cardinals, the, the clergy who elect the Pope. And when they elected a Pope, they did so in the city of Avignon in France. Um, and so the new Pope, rather than being in Rome, ruled from Avignon. And this was sort of a a problem because the Pope's official title is Bishop of Rome, and the seat of power in the church was um, in Rome. That's why it's the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so this sort of became a scandal that the Pope, who's supposed to be, you know, um, representing God on earth and um, above the, the powers of secular kings, was here sort of forced to be in France by the uh, French king. And this went on for nearly uh, seven decades. In 1369, uh, the papacy did move back to Rome after uh, one of those popes died and, and was re-elected. Um, but after that next pope died, there was a, a controversy among the cardinals about who would become the next pope. Um, the cardinals in Italy wanted to elect a Roman pope, or at least an Italian pope, whereas a lot of the other ones who were under the influence of uh, France um, wanted to elect a French pope. Uh, ultimately, what happened is cardinals in both cities elected their own popes. So now we had uh, really two claimants to the position of pope, one in Rome and one in, in Avignon in France. Um, and this really started to split uh, politically people in Europe. Um, depending on where you are, you were loyal to one pope or the other. And a lot of this had to do um, a lot less with theology and a lot more with politics. Um, at one point, their solution was to appoint a, um, a new pope to fire the other two popes. Of course, they, uh, no one really listened to anybody. Um, and ultimately, what had to happen is the Holy Roman Emperor came in and ordered a council to meet, and they fired those popes and went back to a, uh, a previous pope. Um, the, all this really shows is that um, this became a crisis in the church and really weakened the church authority. Um, the position of, position of Pope was still there, and the Pope still exerted some political influence, um, but it really kind of weakened the centrality of the church. This starts a movement in Europe called conciliarism, um, which said that rather than relying just on the position of the Pope, maybe people should rely more on church councils, on, on lots of clergy agreeing to something. Um, and that's going to be important later when we get to the Reformation, is that the position of the weakest, the papacy, was already being weakened. Uh, the next big disaster was a disease that swept through Europe called the Black Death. Um, the Black Death is really uh, a particular um, outbreak of this disease we call the bubonic plague. It's a bacterial infection, and it originated actually in, um, in Asia, probably with the Mongols. Uh, the reason it got to Europe was after the Crusades and with the expansion of the Commercial Revolution, we saw a lot of trade from Asia into Europe. Uh, and the Black Death was a, was a really um, awful disease. Uh, it caused people to break out in boils, um, their lymph nodes would swell, uh, and eventually they die pretty horribly. Um, and the problem was no one really knew what caused the Black Death. Um, no one really knew how to stop it. Uh, medicine at the time, um, you know, existed, but there was no real idea of um, microbiology or disinfecting or anything like that. Uh, people thought bad smells or miasmas what caused the spread of this disease. Uh, so you often see 
um, these plague doctor masks. Uh, plague doctors were professionals, sometimes professionals, um, who would treat people with the plague and uh, the, the long nose the mask would be they stuff flowers and potpourri and things to sort of try and ward off the bad smell. Um, and, and this really started to wear down those institutions we talked about. Um, if you're a priest and it's your job to, you know, treat people who are dying, a lot of the priests were terrified of going into plague-infected cities because they didn't think they'd come back. Um, so the clergy did what they could, and the church advised um, quarantining cities, which they did. But it made people think, well, if the church can't save us, then no one can really save us. Um, and not that yet, sorry. Uh, and also, if you think about feudalism, what feudalism really relies on is a very large population of poor people that you can exploit for labor. With the plague sweeping through, almost a third of the European population was wiped out. Uh, that meant lords couldn't keep enough people on their property. They had to turn to things like paying for them, um, which, you know, under feudalism, you didn't pay for serfs. Serfs worked for you because they're obligated to. But as the, um, the number of laborers went down, the value of their labor went up. Um, and that sort of um, ebbed away the, the influence of feudalism. The last big disaster of the, Middle, the late Middle Ages we'll talk about is the Hundred Years' War. Um, this is a war that did not actually last 100 years, it lasted more than 100 years. Um, but it was a conflict over French territory controlled by England. Remember that England, um, their kings were descended from the Normans after 1066. And the English um, throne also controlled a lot of territory in what is today France, this part up here called Brittany, um, as well as around Bordeaux. Um, and after one of the French kings died, uh, the king of England tried to claim his throne. And so you had a war breakout between England and France over control of the French throne and over territory in France. Uh, it gets more complicated. They're really like four different phases, but um, to sort of simplify things. Um, one of the big advantages the English had early on was the use of a weapon called the longbow. Uh, the longbow is pretty straightforward. It's a bow, and it's long. It's a simple bow, so it's just made from a piece of wood. And uh, the English had started to uh, recruit peasants into their army. Now, remember, one of those key institutions is chivalry. And the idea with chivalry was that um, what makes knights successful is not only their armor and weapons and horses, but the fact that they're honorable and noble um, and often expensive. So one of the big turning points was at the Battle of Crecy. Um, when the English knight, I'm sorry, when the French knights showed up, they saw these English peasants carrying these bows, uh, and they weren't very impressed until when the knights charged and you had this volley of thousands of arrows coming from these English longbowmen. Um, the knights were knocked off their horses, the arrows pierced through their armor, and then the, the longbowmen just walked across the field, slitting the throats of the French knights. And so in a lot of ways, this saw was seen as a, a defeat, not only for France, but, but the whole idea of chivalry. Um, if these noble knights were being turned back by, you know, simple peasants with bows, then, uh, what did that mean for, for warfare? What did it mean for... Um, the position of, of nobility in warfare. Um, so the early part of the Hundred Years' War, it really turned towards England. It looked like England might win. Uh, but then things changed um, when a young peasant woman named Joan showed up and backed the, one of the claimants to the French throne. Um, and she's called Joan of Arc because she was from the city of Arc. And uh, she became sort of this uh, emblem of, of France. Um, she claimed that God had called her um, out of um, her place in the village to lead the, the French um, prince to take, a, take the throne and drive the English out of France. Um, so on the one hand, it, it's sort of this religious background, but also it's happening um, in this idea of nationalism. Um, Keep in mind that in this time, in the Middle Ages, people didn't think themselves as English or French. They tended to more think themselves as belonging to a particular town or a fief. 
um, since that was what they, they were really tied to. That was the social fabric. Um, but Joan really rallied people around the idea of supporting the, the Dauphin, the, uh, the French prince. Um, and she gained his trust and really started winning battles um, across northern France, especially, most importantly, the Siege of Orléans. Um, and eventually, under Joan's leadership, the French army was able to turn the English away. Now, ultimately, Joan was captured by the English. Um, she was tried as a heretic in England, although really that would, was under political influence since the English just didn't like Joan. Um, but she was successful in the sense that the Dauphin did succeed the throne of France and in 1453 solidified his rule. And you can see by this point, uh, he really ruled all of what we think of today as France and drove the English out of France. Um, so you can see how that would have, this, this war affected both uh, feudalism um, in that now people started to think themselves not as just, you know, belonging to this lord or that lord, but as, as belonging to the French king or the English king. Um, but also it, it affected chivalry, uh, you know, seeing these knights bleed out after battles like Crecy, um, falling to simple French peasants, or I'm sorry, English peasants. Um, so this year, 1453, is really a big turning point. A lot of historians point to this as the end of the Middle Ages. Uh, the two big events were the end of the Hundred Years' War here, but also on the other side of Europe, um, Constantinople, um, the Byzantine capital, fell to the Turks. Um, and it's really the last vestige of the Roman Empire that falls. So we can say by 1453, we've reached the end of the Middle Ages in Europe.